Hi there. Let's talk about graphic novels. In this lecture, we're going to look at the origins of this idea of the graphic novel and the people who were the real motivators and drivers of this long form comics. So to begin with, the word graphic novel appears, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, in Bloodstar, a publication illustrated by Richard Corbin and written based on a short story by Robert E. Howard. The book is only 104 pages long, which is fairly small by graphic novel standards today, but it was three times as long as a comic. And so calling it a comic book was not exactly correct because comic books were actually magazines, but they weren't actually magazines. So you see how the word comic book sort of interrupted the possible development of a longer form version of itself because the word book was already being used to describe something much smaller. And so Bloodstar is the first use of the word. More famously, it was promoted by Will Eisner. Now, Will Eisner's had a very long career in comics. You can remember him all the way back to the beginnings of the golden age of comics. He's now employed at a university teaching comics, and it's here he begins to develop his ideas about sequential art and begins to ruminate about making a real ambitious art version of comics. He compiles a number of short stories in his Contract with God, and he brings to these short stories a lot of the themes and ideas that he has been working on, but he's sort of going away from any kind of fantasy or any kind of film noir treatment and instead, he wants to look at the downtrodden, the ordinary, the commonplace, the people who grew up in the New York neighborhood that he was most familiar with. And so this is a very important characteristic of a lot of what would become known as a graphic novel, is this idea of more autobiographical, or certainly a kind of personal narrative, uh, a kind of longer introspective version of a comic. Will Eisner, as we remember, was obsessed with rain and puddles and wind and sort of dramatic passions of his characters in a Jewish community in the poor downtrodden neighborhoods that he grew up in. And in this, he, we really see a kind of look at the way people struggled with their morality, they struggled with their faith in God, and the way in which they tried to maintain their dignity in front of the harsh economic realities. The man who is really responsible for promoting the first major graphic novel, Art Spiegelman, is not a man who actually cared much for the word. It was sort of foisted on him by his publisher. But Art Spiegelman was a real devotee of experimental comics. He loved Mad Magazine as a kid. You see him here um, as a kid growing up in New York and just falling head over heels with its geek culture that he immediately identified with. For a long time, he was working in a variety of different styles and forms autobiographical comics that were being published in small press magazines. You can see here his first personal narrative, Prisoner on Hell Planet, where he describes the suicide of his mother and his own emotional turmoil. He also experimented with, you know, exploring ways in which comics could take on different styles and the way in which a comic can be looked at in a very sort of artistic art history lens. Here he adopts the, the manner of Picasso in a cubist way to kind of bring about a kind of fun play on the ideas of a completely different visual representation that was possible. The problem that 
Art Spiegelman had was there was really no venue to publish the kinds of comics that he was interested in. So he and his wife, Francois Moulet, they teamed up together to produce Raw, which was a big art magazine in a format that was meant to take on the idea of a magazine like Andy Warhol's very popular interview magazine, which sort of inspired them to think that there was an audience for some really different kind of experimental comics. So they start out with this very large format publication in bold colors. And again and again, they found themselves at odds. The audience just wasn't there for this super ambitious art publication. So it begins to shrink down to a more manageable size and eventually is picked up by Penguin and is smaller digest version. But it's in Raw magazine that Art Spiegelman begins to publish a serialized version of the story that would launch the idea of the graphic novel. This was his story he called Mouse. Now the inspiration for Mouse was from a lecture he heard about the idea of the origins of Mickey Mouse being blackface minstrelsy, and that minstrelsy and the way in which mice represented vermin and the idea that they were outcasts from society inspired him to really try and tackle the history of the rise of fascism in Germany and his parents' own experience in Germany and their escape through the tortures of the Holocaust. Now, from 1980 to 86, he's slowly parceling out his publication, and then it finally finishes part two in 1991. And it's in 1992 that he's recognized by the Pulitzer Foundation for his unique contribution to literature. In fact, what's so curious about the Pulitzer Prize he receives in 1992 is that it's beyond category. Now, there are some 40 to 50 different categories for Pulitzer Prize, but there was no category for what Art Spiegelman had created, a long-form comic that was autobiographical, but clearly fantastical. It dealt with Um, an imaginative and, at the same time, deep and probing personal history of the rise of fascism and Germany and his parents' own account of it. And it was just this extraordinary visual tale. I will never forget my own experience reading this in a bookstore in 1990s and being sort of duped into thinking, oh, it's just a comic. I can read this. I would normally not pick up a book about the Holocaust on a casual basis. But here, I found myself drawn in and really struck by the extraordinary power of the story of Art Spiegelman's parents and their struggle to survive the horrors of the Holocaust. So, in the pages of Raw, a number of artists would find a place to begin their publication history. They would become really well-known, and they began to really create a very powerful vocabulary. They could work entirely in their own style, their own story subjects. They weren't subject to the vagaries of the interests of the publisher. And so the raw generation really is a very independent and autonomous group of artists who really see themselves first as artists who are drawn to comics, and then second as comic artists who are making and working and publishing in this particular medium. And this raw generation was not just an American publication. They published work from avant-garde artists in Europe and Africa and elsewhere in Asia as well. One of the artists who became very well known through the raw publication was Chris Ware. Chris Ware is really quite of an odd 
Doc, when it comes to comics, his work is so precise, so extremely, excessively meticulous in its construction. It's all hand-drawn in hand-inked, where something like this today could be pretty easy to mock up on a computer. Everything he does is still has that sort of obsessive attention to detail. And it's really astounding, the artistic excellence in which he brings the precision to it. His first publication came fast on the heels of Art Spiegelman's mouse, Jimmy Corrigan, the smartest kid on the earth, won several awards for its um, length and complexity. And it tells the story, again, of a kind of hapless individual, Jimmy Corrigan, and his sort of complex relationship to his parents and his sort of inability to kind of become the hero of his own story. One of the things I find really fascinating about Chris Ware is this way in which he delves into a kind of nostalgic look of books and arts of the past. He brings them up and adds this wonderful, sort of vicious, ironic commentary into what he does. Every aspect of his publications is just beautifully realized with incredible detail. Take, for example, these sort of fake ads, an idea he gets from Mad Magazine. But in this, he really reworks all the copy of the pages and the artwork to create a really dark and cynical view of humanity. There is a playful side to Chris Ware. His Quimby the Mouse is a character who is a kind of old world cartoon character that uh, plays in the margins of many of his comics. And he has this sort of very striking and detailed minimalist design quality, very heavily graphic. I find Chris Ware actually really difficult to read. I feel like I need to pull out a magnifying glass every time I want to sit down to pick up one of his books. Uh, and, I, and I think that that sort of hesitancy I have to read him is, is part of the allure as well, that you, it's a really quite a commitment to trying to parcel out what's going on in these pages. The other artist in the Raw Generation was Gary Panter, who is really diametrically opposite from Chris Ware in so many ways, instead of that sort of tight, pristine, clean line that Chris Ware had, Gary Panter is scratchy and punk and really raw. And the lettering is all over the place, and especially in his early work where he does a lot of pop culture references in this kind of scratchy, messy, uh, hand-drawn uh, panels. Later on, he takes on a more vivid and dramatic style with his Jimbo series. Here is Jimbo in Hell, and you can see their title character dealing with a sort of the excess of pop culture images and references showering down on top of him. Gary Panter also does this kind of artwork. He's one of the few artists who moves between art galleries selling his original work as art and comics. And he has a, a huge, broad, popular following in many different parts of the world. And so as an artist, comic maker, he's had uh, tremendous success sort of going between both of those jobs. Another artist who is really more solidly in the retro camp uh, world is Charles Burns, who has this really striking black and white style with these bold waves and curled hair and these dark pitch black shadows that sort of reminiscent of Dick Tracy in its excess. But it has uh, also this wonderful drama and weird humor uh, about his work as well. 
Charles Burns did a whole series called Black Hole. I sort of investigated these sort of uh, mutant teenagers and the sort of infections that keep drawing them together, but also contaminating one each other. And the sort of the tensions and anxieties of high school um, amplified by these uh, disturbing mutations that are running through their population. Perhaps one of the most successful artists of the raw generation, Daniel Close, was not actually a part of Raw magazine. Art Spiegelman, in hindsight, says he didn't really understand Daniel Close's work. It seemed like a copy of Bernard Kriegstein's humorous style in Mad Magazine, kind of retro 1950s uh, way of approaching the subject. But Daniel Close and his publications called Eat Ball have really proven to be quite extraordinary and have a huge following. Many of Daniel Close's standalone stories that appeared in his own publication called Eight Ball were made subsequently into movies. Perhaps you saw Ghost World or heard of the movie Ghost World. Well, it was based on Daniel Close's work, and he actually worked to adapt his story into a screenplay. He also worked on the movie called Art School Confidential. So Daniel Close has a really funny, ironic style. It's a parody, but what exactly is the subject of his parody? Here we see, in a sort of typical autobiographical comic, we see Daniel Close himself flossing his teeth, shaving, and then there's an off-screen dialogue, and we, we shift our our attention, we actually see now Daniel Close, the cartoonist, drawing himself in the bathroom, giving this sort of artist's take on the making of his graphic novel. But we see this sort of funny movie set with all these extras and key grips in the background. And he has this little dialogue that says, the real Close. I mean, this is part of what makes his comedy so fascinating is like, well, of course this isn't the real close. And of course this isn't anything to do with how comics are actually made. And that's part of what close is all about. He's making fun of himself. He's making fun of everything all the time. There is no thing that he actually has there. Questions to think about in this lecture. Where did the term graphic novel come from? And why did it get used? Question two. What were some of Art Spiegelman's inspirations? Question three. What was Raw Magazine supposed to be? Question four. What kinds of characteristics define the artist's of the raw generation. Question five. What is the subject in Daniel Close's satire?